So welcome everyone, welcome to this, um, I think it's the last session we are having here and um, I thank to be asked to be the chair. Um, we will talk a little bit about climate change and the region, um, the United Arab Emirates in particular and what is following from Paris, the outstanding deal which was struck by the UN and more than 190 nations prior to, um, prior to Christmas last year. Um, my name is Stefan Singer. Um, I'm heading WWF's Global Energy Policy and I will be the moderator. So I'm very happy to have a kind of um, <clears throat> very um, informed, well-known and active um, panel here. What we will do is um, every one of the panelists will talk for roughly four minutes um, as a statement in the beginning. Then I will do probably one or two questions, and then I will, for the last 20 minutes, hand over to you um, so you can ask questions. I would prefer not to send me the questions electronically, but for transparency, I'd like you to raise your hands um, so you don't then suspect me to screen and only take what I like and leave out what I don't like. So for transparency, I would prefer that option in the, in the end. All right, just to jump into that one, I would like to start with Vael Hamdan. Um, he is from Lebanon, and he is the um, Director General of the Global NGOs, and I think there are more than 800 now, of the Global Climate Action Network, which has been active since more than 20 years on working internationally, nationally, and regionally in all regions of the world. And um, Wael will talk a little bit about the Paris implication and what it means for the region in a little bit more detail. Wael, you the floor. Thank you, Stefan. It's, so, what I want to talk specifically about Paris is the main issue. The, uh, Paris is a very historic, important historic agreement that has a lot of implications. Uh, it's very comprehensive. It goes into several aspects and have clear um, action plan and work plan for countries to do and, and work program on, on all various issues. But I think Overall, if you want to look at it from a general perspective, the most relevant issue that uh, it would be important for this region and, oil, uh, and all oil uh, exporting countries is the vision it provides on the long term. Where are we going? What's the direction of, what's the pathway we're going to follow? And this is summarized in two uh, key articles in the agreement, Article uh, 2 and Article 3, in relation to the long-term mitigation goals. So the first one talks about strengthening the temperature tar target, uh, the global target uh, temperature that we need to limit uh, the increase of global temperature under. To the well below two degrees came out of the Cancun uh, decision. And in Paris, what happened, it strengthened that into striving to stay below 1.5. So it clearly has this push to try as much as possible to limit global temperature increase to below 1.5. This, of course, has uh, a lot of implication. And the reason why they moved the, the temperature target is uh, because of the climate change implications, uh, impacts. So under 1.5, there's a big possibility to have really adverse impacts of climate change, such as the collapse of the coral reefs uh, around the world, which would severely uh, reduce the uh, marine economic output. And second, of course, sea level rise, which has huge implication on not only small island states, but also low-lying uh, countries like uh, in the region. It's, it's a huge, and there will be a lot of, uh, um, there will be someone speaking about it specifically. So this is, one move in terms of ambition mitigation. Then this was strengthened in terms of uh, greenhouse gas trajectory where the agreement says that we need to achieve balance between anthropogenic emissions and, and sinks, uh, which translates into net zero emissions. The, so when are we planning to reach net zero emissions? And then the agreement says we need to achieve that in the second half of the century. Now, if you combine both and you say we want to achieve a probability of st staying below 1.5 with a probability of 50%, which to some might not seem very ambitious, but it is uh, uh, something that is technically possible according to scientists, this requires that we achieve the net zero emissions 
of greenhouse gases, all of, green, all of the gases between 2060 and 2080, and then negative emissions afterwards. So if net zero emissions need to be achieved between 2060 and 2080 or for all greenhouse gases, how does it translate to the energy sector? And this is what's important for uh, countries like UAE and countries in the region that are, their economies is heavily dependent on fossil fuels like oil. It is well recognized that decarb full decarbonizing the energy sector is actually easier than doing it for other sectors, especially land use. It, it's very challenging when you go into the meat production and, and, and other land use implications of reducing emissions from there. Uh, implies that the energy sector, and, and when we talk about energy, it's not only electricity, but also mobility, needs to fully decarbonize around mid-century. If we want really, to really implement the Paris Agreement, that's, that's how you, you need to translate it. And for us, full decarbonization around mid-century translates uh, for us that the, the best technology to achieve that is obviously renewable energy, looking at current economics and trends of, and technologies, so achieving 100% renewable energy around mid-century. And I think this is something that uh, the region um, needs to look at and prepare for that. And the region can look at it as a threat or as an opportunity. So to finally say, um, a lot of countries starting to prepare to this fact. You, you can see China canceling all permits for opening new coal power plants, uh, uh, power mines, as well as canceling permits, existing permits for around 1,000 coal, uh, power, uh, power, uh, coal mines, Germany already will finalize in this year a strategy to phase out coal from their system. Obviously, coal is the first source of energy that needs to be moved out of the economic system, and afterwards, we need to move to oil and gas. There will be a window for fossil fuel use, which is around 35 to 40 years, and that's a good opportunity for the countries of the region knowing that the cheapest fossil fuels come out of this region. So out of the budget remaining from the use of fossil fuels is an opportunity for the countries to transform and diversify their economy. Thank you. Thank you, Wael. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is um, Tina Latif, policy advisor particularly on climate change and energy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in UAE. So she had been also a close follower of the Paris outcome and advises the government here. And I'd like to hear from you from a government perspective, um, what does it mean, and more precisely, um, also what signal has been sent out from, from Paris um, to the region and to the actors. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stefan, and thank you, Wael, for that very comprehensive and, and great um, sort of statement, which I think set the scene for, for where, where we are and where we have to move forward. Um, I think as someone who was involved um, in the negotiations for the last two years and certainly involved in COP and the intense uh, experience that was, um, it comes as a, well, not a sad thing, but it's an unfortunate thing that Paris is not in fact the end. There, um, <clears throat> there actually is still a lot of work that needs to be done between now and 2020 for when the agreement comes into place. Um, to prepare the ground for the Paris Agreement and to prepare ourselves for the, for the transition um, that we all uh, spoke about. Um, so from the point of view of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, one of the biggest roles that government can play is sending signals to business and sending signals to the public. Um, because for there to be the level of transformative change that's required by 2020 and by 2060 and onwards, um, and for us to be able to meet the two degree target. Um, it's really critical that all levels of government, all levels of public, all levels of the private sector are really made aware of the, of the social and economic opportunities that can come with climate action. And this is one of the things that I think the UAE really does excel at, and it's something that we've been leading on for a number of years. So if you look back 10 years ago, the UAE was one of the first countries in the region to set renewable energy targets. Um, and this came at a time when there was a lot of um, questions as to the viability of the technology, as to the cost, um, 
but you see now that 10 years on, setting, on, setting those targets and setting those policies has actually had a, an incredibly uh, large impact within the region and has set a very um, normalising effect for, for renewable energy. So you see many GCC partners and Saudi and our other colleagues really moving forward and investing in, in clean energy and renewable energy. Um, and if we come back today, you'll see that within each of the UAE's federal and Emirate level um, visions and strategies for 2020 and 2030, sustainable development is a key pillar. Um, and one of the things that we really tried to emphasize when we were putting together our INDC <coughs> submission for, for <coughs> excuse me, for last year, was to ensure that our INDC reflected the existing policies and the existing strategies that are already in place. Um, many of those strategies are really geared towards diversifying our economy and diversifying our, diversifying our, our energy mix. So one of the key pillars of our, of our INDC, one of the key targets there is a, a target of 24% clean energy um, in the total energy mix by 2021, which is arguably probably one of the most ambitious targets of any of the INDCs that have been presented, particularly when you consider that in 2014, um, I think the total penetration of clean energy in the energy mix was less than 0.2%. And I think even now it's, it's uh, still at 1%. But there are, there are some very big um, projects and initiatives and strategies that are coming on board so that you know, we feel quite confident that within six years we can, we can meet that target. Um, so all of this really comes back to, to, to one clear idea, which is that we need to act now because there are targets that we kind of need to meet in 2016 and, and, and whatnot. Um, but to do this, the focus really has to be on how can we develop solutions that create new economic and social opportunities. Um, and that really is the silver lining of climate change and it's, it's really one of the things that the UAE greatly focuses on. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think many of my colleagues are going to start talking about um, the right. policies and et cetera that, that will underpin that. And, I focused a bit on mitigation. I know um, my colleague from, from uh, Bill Doggerty will also talk about the adaptation side of things, which is also very important, but look forward to thanks, the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is um, based here. He's uh, working as a professor at the Master Institute. Um, his topic is about um, global and regional energy transition. Um, so I'm happy to have as a newcomer on the panel. It's not on the, on the plate. But we're happy to have him here, um, Professor Skouris Skouridis. Skouris, you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, I would like to uh, take the discussion uh, one step back, uh, starting from approximately where Wales stopped, and then bring it back to the region. And uh, the way I would like to frame, first of all, uh, what the transition actually means on a physical level. On a physical level, Going away from fossil fuels by 2050, 2060, et cetera, actually means that we have to accelerate our current installation rates of renewables by a factor of 55. So we are actually installing, in 2013, 2014, we installed about 0 0.1, 0 0.12 terawatts per year. By 2040, if we want to achieve a minimum level of energy availability per capita, which is around 2,000 watts, we need to be installing 55 times that amount. That is about 6 terawatts per year. Now, if we actually want to have an increasing economic growth, so basically we assume that our economic growth continues and we want to support our economy through energy. I mean, these two are coupled, obviously. We were talking about even higher levels of Energy of, of increase in terms of how much installation rates we need to have. We're talking about maybe up to from 8 to 10 terawatts per year. So these are feasible numbers, but these are the numbers that we should be shooting for. And the reason that for these numbers and why you, you haven't heard of them before is that if you look at the climate models, they are, the, the climate economy models, they are looking actually a lot on carbon capture and storage. They are relying a lot on carbon, uh, on, uh, sorry, on carbon capture and storage of existing resources, 
which are actually may not be available in the future. The reserve estimates are actually higher than they have there. And the second part, they rely on nuclear towards the end of the century. And neither of them actually can scale practically and physically. We need to be relying on resources that are actually scalable, and these are renewables. Now, what does that mean for the region? First of all, we have the aspect of the stranded assets, right? So, but if we actually look at which of the oil resources and gas resources should be developed, because then you have to do a cost, opt uh, cost optimization, right? I mean, obviously, you are not going to use the expensive ones, right? You should focus on the ones that are cheaper, and the cheapest resources are still in the region. So a, a recent paper by Magled and Elkins uh, in, in science basically estimated that the region has access, even with a two-degree target, to approximately 60 to 70 percent of its existing reserves. So more or less to give you a sense, that means that even if we continue for all GCC countries producing at the day they are producing today, at the rate that they are producing today, they can go all the way until 2050. And at that point, they need to stop. Right? So that means that that gives quite a bit uh, of substantial export potential that uh, the GCC countries can support. Assuming, of course, that the coal and the shale gas and the tar sands will actually not be producing. Right? So that means that you have to, to go to the accessible, cheap energy resources. Now, so that brings us to the point that actually to make the transition, to have the renewable energy capacity installations to 55 times what we're installing today, we do need energy for it. And the energy is not coming from nowhere. It's not fiat money you, what, that you can print. That energy will be coming actually from the fossil fuel that we're using today. We're talking about a solar strategy here. I mean, like a farmer is actually using a percentage of its output to, for the next year, this is what we are talking about when we talk about the uh, renewable energy transition. We need to invest our current available uh, fossil fuels before we exceed the targets, before we exceed the, uh, the, the limits set by IPCC in order to power the transition in the future. Now, going back to the region and just, I, I think I have a minute or so. One minute. Yeah, and uh, it is a very interesting uh, case of uh, perhaps translation, I don't know what, but uh, I would really love for the UAE to be able to meet, to meet its INDC uh, target, which says 24% of energy mix. The reality is that in IRENA, we helped IRENA to do uh, the remap analysis for the UAE, uh, the REMAP analysis for the UAE uh, was ending in 2030, that was the target, and it was trying to get 10%, not 24, but 10% of the primary energy mix by renewables in the country. And based on this study, basically what we have uh, identified is you need to, be, to have installed in place by 2030 approximately 25 gigawatts, right, of renewables. So that means 25 gigawatts you need to be installing all the way to 2030 about two gigawatts a year, right? In order to reach the 10%. If you want the 24%, and that includes the nuclear, everything. If you want 24% of the primary energy mix by 2021, I would really love to see tomorrow installations of several gigawatts a year, so. Thanks, um, to illustrate the challenge. Um, <clears throat> I think other countries face the same challenge. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but I think we need to take that serious. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is um, um, Bill Doherty. Um, he is a um, well-known expert on impacts and adaptation. He is from AGD. And uh, Mr. Doherty will tell us a little bit about the potential impact of unabated climate change or even um, impacts and adaptation needs under a system when climate change is, is limited, even to below two degree adaptation is required. Bill, yours is the floor. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here, and I hope that you've gotten a good sense from my colleagues as they've talked about the transition that's needed to uh, bring the global economy away from a reliance on carbon emitting uh, materials to something that is uh, sustainable and will not 
further destabilize the climate. What I'd like to do is, alongside of that great challenge, is to lay before you a little bit of the great challenge associated with dealing with the legacy of past carbon emissions on the planet, and specifically uh, as part of the GD, which stands for the Abu Dhabi Global Environment Initiative, to talk a little bit about the kinds of impacts associated with climate change that even if we were to stop emitting tomorrow, would still be felt here in the region as well as around the world. Uh, the focus of the, the work that Ajiti does is on essentially making the data that policymakers need to, to be able to make informed decisions about one policy or another to combat climate change. It's to provide that kind of information by relying on past work, building on that work, and then making information available in ways that can be used by policymakers in dealing with the challenge of climate change. But this region in particular, the work that Ajiti does focuses on looking at local, national, and regional impacts associated with climate change. And as you know, climate change is probably the epitome of a cross-cutting issue, a cross-cutting challenge. When we think about reducing the vulnerability of key ecosystems and sectors of climate change, we're talking about water, we're talking about coastal zones, we're talking about terrestrial ecosystems and marine ecosystems, we're also talking about socioeconomic systems like public health, like the dependence on desalination and its impact on Gulf waters. And so this is the basic umbrella that Ajiti looks at in terms of trying to help policymakers understand, understand the impact, the physical impacts of climate change by using science and trying to communicate those results. I will briefly lay out in the time that I have some of the things that what we are doing. We have research teams from all over the world contributing to the work of the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi in trying to apply the latest state-of-the-art models and tools to analyze the impacts of climate change on key systems in the country based upon the outcomes of the work of the IPC uh, and the work of that's, that has come out from, uh, the declarations coming out from COP21. Starting all of that is trying to get an idea of what climate change means in the region on the Arabian Gulf as well as on the atmosphere here. <coughs> so there's been a big effort to use the latest models using also the, the uh, supercomputers to analyze regional atmospheric changes that are expected. And there have been uh, a number of outputs that are currently in process of being uh, pr produced or made available to the public. Another parallel side has been on the oceans. What's going to happen to the commercial fisheries, the all, a very important industry here in the region, commercial fishery, fisheries, as the Arabian Gulf becomes more saline, as the circulation patterns change, as the sea surface temperature in the top and the bottom of the Gulf change. There are studies that show that some of these important fish species will be migrating away out of the Gulf into uh, environments that are more uh, comfortable or more easy to uh, pr reproduce. Uh, and so that's another aspect. We're also thinking about the precious water resources. M as probably most of you know, all of the groundwater, or at least a great majority of the groundwater that's used in Abu Dhabi, the UAE, is based on fossil groundwater. That is, it's not recharged annually. Uh, and so the reliance on desalination, the question comes up then, with the use of the Arabian Gulf as the feedstock for desalination and the highly saline brine that's discharged to the Arabian Gulf, what is that going to do to contribute to the degradation of ecosystems in the Gulf? Coastal zones, uh, sea level rise is probably the most obvious impact that you think of when, when it comes to coastal zones. But we can also think about the vulnerability of the infrastructure uh, and the vulnerability of certain land use types like mangroves and seagrass beds and things like that. And then finally, the last thing I'll, I'll say before Dr. Stephen hits me over the head is that we're also looking at the impact of the, this transition 
on public health. For example, if one reduces dependence on fossil fuels across the board, not only in the electric sector, but also in transport, what does that mean for pollution? Not only are we reducing CO2, but we're also reducing the air pollutants associated with that, and that is going to bring a co-benefit on public health. Uh, these are just some of the things. I, I could go all day, but we're, uh, we're learning a lot, and hopefully this is going to be of use not only to the UAE, but also to the region. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm sure we come back on some of those issues. Um, now, my last speaker is uh, Tanzid Alam. Someone described him to me the other day as a local NGO hero here. He's leading the climate energy work for um, the Emirates Wildlife Society as an associate partner of WWF. So, um, Tanzit, um, you also the floor, and um, I hope you tell us a little bit what you think, what your organization thinks should be done in the UAE to address the climate change urgency, to address the clean energy needs. Great, thank you very much. And um, it's good to see a, a well, semi, semi full room, especially because it's the last uh, session of the whole summit. Um, so, I'd like to do a quick show of hands. How many of you have been to this summit before? Okay, good. So as you know, this place is a hotbed for announcements. So announcements are made in this country on a very, very regular basis. And as an independent non-governmental organization, our position is we want to see these announcements being translated into action on the ground. We want to see implementation of what is being pledged on paper, what is being said in speeches, what you read about in the media. We want to see things being implemented. So that's our interest on this topic. Now, secondly, we think, given um, the vulnerabilities that climate change poses to the UAE, uh, that builds, I'd really encourage all of you to try and read some of the research that Ajidi is coming out with. It's, um, it shows that climate change is very real for this region. And in fact, if you look at some of the temperature-related events and the humidity-related events that happened last year in, in this region with record temperatures in, um, in Iran, in Iraq, that's predicted to become more frequent, the hot, summer, humid days. Now, this could really threaten very much the ways in which the economy would function and generate value from construction projects being potentially at risk. So the, the threats of climate change are very real for the UAE, which we believe demands urgent national action and for it to be a priority issue. Now, then the third part of this is the leading by example aspect. So I think Paris provides a very good opportunity for the UAE to lead by example, to mitigate its own emissions. Because if you look at those countries around the world that are the most vulnerable, like the small island states, they are actually some of the ones who are le really leading by example, setting 100% renewable energy visions and targets. So the UAE, we believe, could do that. Just look at the recent announcement by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed um, <coughs> bin Rashid Al Maktoum of Dubai. He mentioned Dubai wants to generate 75% of its energy from solar by 2050, 30% by 2030. We'd like to see this kind of action actually being translated at a federal level in the form of a federal renewable energy target, as well as translated, uh, respectfully, Tina, in the INDCs when it's upgraded in the future for a revised UAE target. Now, targets are one thing. We also want to see policy frameworks being established at a federal level. So a federal climate change and energy policy in the UAE is critical with targets for carbon reduction, with targets for energy efficiency, because that's a really crucial enabler for greater carbon reduction, with targets for renewable energy, with enabling mechanisms that may make sure that private investment comes to the table. Um, because in a time when government funding and uh, revenue streams are reducing, it's really, enable, it's really important that they try to enable the right kind of private investment. And then, uh, I don't know how many points are made, but fourth, fourthly, <laughs> I'd like to say we want to see much better governance and institutional roles and responsibilities defined in the, in the UAE. You sometimes get a lot of overlapping roles and turf warfare on the issue of climate change. There is no real ownership of that issue. It sits within different ministries. We want to see actually that being consolidated somehow from a mitigation perspective, from an adaptation perspective. 
So, uh, and also the link between the federal and the emirate level policy making is still not very clear. There's sometimes a lot of inefficiencies that happen. Um, so, you know, just for example, just um, look at the metro system in Dubai. It ends at the border basically with Abu Dhabi. So it's important to think about these things in an integrated overall country perspective. Then um, finally, I'd like to also make the point about capacity in the institutions themselves. The UAE is a relatively new country, but at the same time, these would require substantial investments and thought processes going into investing in new sectors, which could add more economic value. We need to essentially see um, much stronger skills-based trained UAE nationals coming through the ranks to actually lead some of these agencies, because ultimately the fate of the country depends in the hands of a very small percentage of um, nationals who work here, not necessarily the expats like you and I. So we as an NGO are working on this topic to help build capacity, to work with decision makers in the government to educate them about these sorts of topics. We have projects where we collaborate with groups uh, like MOFA, by, uh, with groups like Ajidi, and uh, we very much look forward to working with people who are interested on these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Tanzit. Um, <clears throat> before I will um, ask you for questions, let, let, let me ask um, a question to all of you, and um, each of you is invited to respond shortly, briefly. So what do you think, in a nutshell, are the most important policies, one or two, no more, please, just select those? prioritize those. I know it's difficult, everything clings together, I know that one, but let's prioritize here for the sake of this exercise. What do you think are the most important one or two policies which the region or the government needs to do by tomorrow? As smart, as precise as possible, including adaptation, by the way. So, who wants to make a start? I can say one thing. Please. Um, one of the things that, <clears throat> when you think about physical impacts of climate change, and the planning response to it, it's really important for policymakers, in my view, to understand, appreciate, and act upon the integrated nature of the, res of the required response. That is, uh, adaptation to, to these adverse impacts associated with climate change requires an integrated response in, in that we're looking at systems rather than silos. So we're not just focusing on how to make the transport sector more resilient, but we're, or how to make water resources less vulnerable. We're trying to think about those systems in an integrated way. So I think if I have two, I would suggest to emphasize integrated water resource management as a way of adaptation in the water sector, and integrated coastal zone management as a way of adaptation in the coastal zone. Area. Thank you. Tina? Um, I was going to say maybe to make life easier, I completely agree with everything that Tanzi said, particularly in the latter part of his statement. Um, and I would not suggest a particular policy intervention, but I would say that there really does need to be a focus on capacity building. Um, the thing that we sometimes forget, particularly when we look around in the UAE and see the incredible resources and infrastructure and whatnot that we have, is that the UAE is 42 years old. It's a very, very small country. And I'm originally from Australia, and it was one of the biggest lessons learned here is that there is not the um, you know, history that we've taken from uh, Britain and developed amongst ourselves for hundreds of years that exists here. So there still needs to be a lot of work to be done <clears throat> in developing the institutional structures, in developing the um, entities that will have the mandates that you kind of speak of, um, and also developing the local uh, knowledge. And one of the proudest things that I've, I've really had in my short time here is, is to see how, how quickly and how determined, particularly diplomats within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are, um, and how quickly they're growing. But it does take a generation, and it does take time, but it's something that we need to focus on. Okay. Bayel? Yeah. Uh, so The Guardian and many other, and very, precise. very short, very short. The, the Guardian and many other media describe Paris as the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. And the first thing I think the region needs to think about is grasp this, this concept and understand that it's a reality. I know it's very hard. Most industries, 
uh, reject, like, you know, the regular telephone industry rejected the idea that cell phones are going to become the future, and, and, and they really were harmed really bad from it. It's an opportunity, like I said. This is the reality. This is what Paris, if it's Im implemented, means, and they <clears> need to, have, uh, to accept it clearly. And we see signs of that. We see uh, the, the leaders of UAE saying that we're going to celebrate the last drop of oil. They say there's a recent ministerial retreat to develop a strategy for beyond oil, and that's what exactly needs to happen, and they need to make it a reality and a fact for, for the country. Thanks. Tanzit? Sure. Um, so from a, to answer your question, Stefan, about what policy is required, we want to see the development of a federal climate change and energy policy that also includes measures for adaptation to the impacts of climate change, an integrated federal climate change policy. Now, there are other visions out there, like the green economy vision. There's apparently an energy vision being developed. And it's not a repetition of these. They need to speak to each other. There needs to be effective kind of, they need to kind of learn from each other and, and actually kind of reinforce some of those sorts of aspects that are overlapping potentially. But really in light of Paris, it'd be interesting for the UAE to see what its role is essentially in a one and a half degree centigrade world. Mm -hmm. So that's our position is to keep to one and a half degrees because of the impacts that would have on biodiversity, on, on physical infrastructure and so on. So um, that's a big challenge. And this transition away from oil and gas as a source of income is gonna be a very important area for the UAE to navigate around. Just yesterday, Irina released this report that showed the huge potential that renewables has in this region to create jobs, to reduce water consumption, to, um, to contribute to GDP, and so on. At the same time, you know, you look at plans to develop coal happening in Dubai, which we don't really see how that squares the circle between decarbonization on one side and the rhetoric we hear to uh, going towards clean energy versus the actual role and the potential that renewables has. So there's still a lot of contradictory statements and initiatives on the ground. So we want to see consistency. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Skouris. So, uh, since my colleagues covered a more general or broader perspective, and the question is, okay, let's have two uh, regulatory uh, issues that we would like to address. The first one that I think would make a huge impact is to streamline the pricing of natural gas and resources across agencies. So that the industries don't see the subsidized price there is one price that at least we understand what is the cost so that we can develop the industries according to that real price of, car, of natural gas in the country. The second one that I would like to see is very concrete targets for the adoption of renewable energy. And concrete, not in terms of percentages, but in terms of gigawatts. Mm -hmm. Next year, we will input one gigawatt. The next year, we will put two. The next year, three. That is the best way to actually get the best price for your renewables and develop an industry locally. Thank you. Thank you for this precise proposal. I have a second question to you, please very short. We talk a lot about, when we talk about renewables, about electricity, and that's fair and that's fine because I think that's where we start and that's comparably easy. What are we doing about transport? Can, you mentioned transport as also an issue for adaptation because we know worldwide um, three billion no, sorry, three million people are dying annually, prematurely, from conventional air pollution worldwide. This is more than malaria and AIDS combined. It's one of the biggest causes of premature deaths worldwide, many in developing countries, and not only in Delhi and, and Beijing. So what are we doing on transport? Who wants to go first? Yeah, go on, first one. Short, please, huh? Then I hand over to you. Oh, uh, transport needs to electrify, period. And when we talk about ground transport, it has to electrify, it can be electrified. Electric cars, batteries are going very good, are doing very well. We have electric trains, electric buses, uh, and even for freight, whatever we cannot ship on um, uh, a, a, a rail freight system that is electrified, we can fairly easily, I mean, look at the, let's say, the dedicated freight lines that we essentially have in the UAE. Imagine now a catenary that provides electricity to diesel electric hybrid uh, uh, trucks, trucks and buses. It's easily done. I mean, it requires a lot of investment to get 
the, basically the transporters to actually change their fleet. That's, that's an expensive proposition. It's not the infrastructure so much, but it's the fleet itself. Now, but the thing here is, if we actually look at the fleet that operates in the country, there is clearly raises the issue of inadequate uh, enforcement of standards. Definitely in the freight industry, because we see that diesel trucks are not even Euro 2. Right? Mm. So, I mean, we, if we start enforcing the standards, okay. we will push a little bit the industry as well. Transit? Yeah. So we are actually working on a project with uh, the Emirates Standardization and Metrology Authority, where we are helping them this year to develop a vehicle fuel economy standard. Now, um, Saudi Arabia has, uh, so this is based on a um, similar standard to what was approved in, uh, in the US, the corporate average fuel economy, where Saudi has set targets for their manufacturers to meet fuel efficiency requirements. So the UAE is studying uh, putting this kind of regulation in place. So um, this has huge carbon reduction potential and to bring in hybrids and the best technologies to the market. Thank you. Well, short. Very short. Since I was talking about visions, let's talk about uh, long-term vision. For, because when we talk about zero emissions, that includes the transport sector. And obviously, the hierarchy has to be changed. Non-motorized modes of transport followed by public transport. This should take the majority of the uh, transportation. But also, the huge investment we see in the electric car from Google, from Amazon, from Apple, and all the, uh, the manufacturers. That, there's a promising uh, future for the electric car. Thank you. Um, I'd like now to go to the audience. I'm happy to take, wow, this gentleman there on the left side was first. Please introduce yourself and ask the short question and do me address this question, please. Thank you. My name is, uh, there should be a mic coming. My name is the Dr. Faisal Safi from the uh, University of uh, UAEU in LA. And uh, my question is actually, can be shared by anybody. It's just a very general question. And it is, we had conventions and conferences about climate change and whatnot to change stuff from Kyoto until Paris and looking forward. Uh, there have been some failures and stuff like that. How Paris Convention will change the game or how this uh, conference will be implemented uh, or be successful in future. Now we have a decision. Is it going to be implemented? What are the incentives for that? What are the chances for that? And the other question is for Dr. Uh, Skouris specifically, how you can, or what's the mechanism, what's the, um, the tactics to implement or to enhance the implementation of PV and renewable energies in UAE, uh, in UAE particularly? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think, I think we tackle a little bit how and what are the policies to implement this. I, mean, I think your first question was roughly responded to by the introductory statement, so I'd like to go to your second question directly to Skores, please. If you want to respond to that one and others, feel free to chip in. Sure. Short, uh, please. On the, I think uh, in terms of the implementation of uh, renewables, I, I feel that uh, we are on the right track. We, are, we realized as a country that actually renewable is actually cost Renewables, and PV specifically, is cost competitive with gas today on the levelized cost of energy basis. Now, that doesn't mean that it's on the system-wide basis, right? So, I mean, we have to understand that as, as we increase the penetration, we need to adopt, I mean, uh, uh, to adapt the system as it is operating today. That, I think, is, is a critical aspect because, in, uh, for example, in Abu Dhabi, the IWPPs, they have uh, take-or-pay uh, contracts. So if we start reducing the uptake or the offtake from them, we would have to pay them anyway. I mean, this, these things need to be revised. Uh, right now, we are uh, at the levels of it, uh, penetration that we're talking about. It's really a matter of really connecting the, uh, building and connecting the PV panels. That, that's, I mean, once we start exceeding 10%, yes, then we start, we need to kind of consider other things. But the key part here is to provide the incentives in the organizational structure to kind of capitalize and leverage the fact that you have a source of energy that's actually cheaper than your primary input. Thank you. I had a, I had a hand up over there, this gentleman, two hands actually. Can we take both questions together and, yeah? Hi, my name is Adam Mehmed and I'm a business development executive at Zohar Renewable Energy. Now my question is a general question. You guys have mentioned the Paris climate change and it cannot be overrated. It's very important, everyone knows that. 
But the main question is, can this be done in, let's say, 2050? As he said, it's, very, it's a very important question. A lot of people are pessimistic, and as Dr. Sigordis has mentioned, we have to accelerate our installation rates. Now, this is alarming. How can this be done, especially considering the financing part? And my second question is, regarding public awareness, it's not only about installing solar panels. Can we just stick to uh, one question, please? Yes. Because other people also like to ask us one at a time. So just about uh, financing the public and the other. awareness and the health aspects. One of the question, world. please, per person. Thank you, sir. The other gentleman behind you, I think, has his head up as well. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Bat Haj, and I'm from the University of Southampton, UK. Um, in relation to getting these targets set up, we in the UK have a, what's called a Climate Change Act, which is um, uh, supporting the UK policy, 80% reduction of emissions from 1990 level uh, by 2050 by 80%. And I think if you want to get these targets, you need to have something like this type of act, not only in one country, but all around the world. And I think I, I would actually also add that the United Arab Emirates, being a young country, have a better advantage than the UK to actually benefit from this. So what's your question? My question is, do we have a level of policy to allow similar acts to be around in the world, especially here in the United Arab Emirates? Thank you. First question on financing, to scale up renewables significantly. Um, I've Tanzit and Vael. Great. Um, well, firstly, I think we need, we need to start with some foundations. Uh, there's no federal policy framework for renewable energy. So we need that in place that enables the financing to flow. So Dubai would be a very interesting example to look at where how DIWA structured its bidding process for the, for the, for the recent uh, tendering that it's done and where it got the record low bid from Aqua Power for PV. So um, there's a lot that the Emirates can learn from each other. Um, I'm optimistic, um, although my initial comments may not sound that, but I think I am optimistic about this. Uh, just yesterday, the Minister of Energy um, mentioned that he would like to see the UAE essentially exporting ele renewable-powered electricity to Europe. So that's the kind of visionary long-term thinking that this country has sometimes, which can be really transformational. So just look at how quickly the, tra the country has developed. If that visionary thinking is translated into how do we decarbonize our economies based on renewables and energy efficiency, I'm sure the right kind of frameworks could be put in place very quickly and easily. Thanks, Wael, shortly. Yeah, I have actually no doubt that the Paris Agreement will be implemented. And actually, if you look at all the agreements before, they are implemented, but they weren't the right agreement. So they set up targets in Kyoto. They were achieved by most countries and even overshot by many countries, but we never had this comprehensive agreement before. This is the first agreement that says where we're going and the process to achieve it. And the technology, I mean, if you look at human history, all predictions on how fast we're going to achieve something has been underestimated. If you look at, at the penetration uh, of many technologies, it over exceeded what uh, a lot of experts have expected. And I think because of the concern about, about climate change and how many countries have joined the fight and how much research money is put into it, mm -hmm. I, I will not be surprised how uh, uh, that we're going to overcome the investment targets and the renewable energy targets. It requires a lot of work from all of us to achieve it. Um, but if you look at how sh shifting investments now the, the next step, if you look at the Agenda 2030 coming out of the SDGs negotiation in New York and how Why much they're integrating, shifting development finance to green sustainable one, the uh, subsidies amounting to around four trillion direct and indirect subsidies for fossil fuels, you shift those and you'll have more than enough resources to actually- Thank you. The second question, who wants to take the second question? For the gentleman from the UK. Tina, is that something for you or Bill? Can you remind you want us of the question? Can you remind us of the question? Um, I, I, your hypothesis, hypothesis was based on the Climate Change Act in the UK. You would need something like this, okay. not, only, not only in the UK, but globally, and you believe it's doable also in the UAE. A long-term climate change reduction of emissions 
of more than 80% until 2050, as in the UK, enshrined in the law. So is such a law possible in the region? A climate change, a legally binding climate change law. Who wants to take that one? Tina? I was just going to say, just to take a step back, I think sometimes, um, particularly pre-Paris, a lot of these conversations are about, you know, we must do this, we should do this, we could do this, but I think we often forget that in Paris we, we achieved what we wanted to achieve. For coming into 2020, each country in the world will be required to submit con uh, communications and pledges which outline what their mitigation commitments or actions will be. And that's a very positive thing. And I think even, um, I understand there's a, there's a lot to be done within the UAE in terms of building up institutions and capacities, but a lot of it isn't rhetoric. A lot of stuff is being done. We have a lot of these frameworks um, and a lot of these policies that, that are seeing results. So. Thank you. Bill. No, no it's okay. I didn't realize, I mean, I would have wished there would be more questions on adaptation and impact because that region is at the front line. It's already pretty hot here. I'm saying this because I'm coming from the <laughs> north. I'm not used to it. So, <laughs> um, I could mention we, something on that, Stefan. On the you want to mention the adaptation thing? Very well, shortly. I think it would be useful to really, kind of for the UAE, to really look at its risks and vulnerabilities across the board. Um, to, in terms of its sectors of economy, the economy that might be vulnerable, so if salinity increases in the Gulf, what does that mean for desalination? And what kinds of technology choices need to happen today to ensure that we're best prepared for those impacts in the future? Um, if temperature and humidity increases in the future, what does it mean for the types of air conditioning and technology improvements in air conditioning that we might require and investments and so on that needs to flow as a result of that? So th these are some of the, uh, they need to be studied. And uh, th this kind of vulnerability and risk assessment would be really important to do so the country can have a good, strong science-based adaptation policy. Um, and uh, the Ministry of Environment is developing an adaptation policy at the moment, uh, but I, I feel they require more support and, and capacity Thanks. to enable them to do this work properly. Thanks, Tanzit. Um, unfortunately, we're coming to an end. Um, I will take the opportunity to, I think, four key points, and forgive me, I picked them out from the discussion, which I found most interesting, I think, for the takeaway as a kind of um, informal conclusions. Um, first, for me, is um, what came out is that simply Paris, if implemented, seals the fate of fossil fuels. It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when and how diversification away from fossil fuels is urgently needed. A strategy is required for doing that, particularly in that region, but I think also another in other countries who are either exporters of fossil fuels or users of fossil fuels as well, I think that's equally important. Um, second is um, that for the region here, we need um, a kind of federal climate change policy, a law, an implementation plan which is comprehensive, which includes renewables, energy efficiency, education, capacity building, adaptation, in particular with a focus on integrated water management and integrated coastal management. Um, and um, lastly, it's absolutely necessary to scale up with financing, with adequate frameworks, the um, huge potentials on renewables in the region, solar in particular, not only in UAE, solar in particular, and what Tanzit said, to look into long-term vision rather exporting fossil fuels exporting renewable electricity, which is abundantly available here to the rest of the world. I hope I covered almost everything. I thank you for your, for, your, for your kind attention, and please join me with a round of applause for our panelists.